Education Mobile, quality e-learning experience on the go. Welcome to Fusion Mobile e-learning clinic. My name is Sonia Alawalua and I'll be walking you through the physics course. Today we want to look at machines. Hmm, interesting topic. Well, under this topic we'll be looking at the definition of machines, um, we'll talk about mechanical advantage and velocity ratio, we'll look at classification, uh, uses and application of machines and friction. Alright, let's take up the subject. What is a machine? Many times when I, people hear the name machine, what comes to mind is one very heavy machinery or probably a car or a motorbike or something. Well, a machine doesn't have to be that complex. A machine can be as simple as a cock opener. Anything that makes, that allows work to be done more conveniently is called a machine. So anything that makes work done conveniently, that makes work done easily, that makes work simple is a machine. So just like your cock opener that I described, your bottle opener, you cannot carry a bottle of Pepsi and you want to use your finger to open it like that guy in 7-Up used to do those years. That was a deception. doesn't open. You, and you cannot use your hand to pull it off. It won't work. Like, okay, yeah. Like the 7-Up advert guy used to do. It won't open. You cannot use your finger to push it off or use your hand to pull it off. In fact, if you should succeed, you would have used even more energy than if you should just take a bottle opener to open it. So certain times you can do some work without the use of machines, but with the use of machine, it becomes more convenient. It becomes easier. It becomes simpler. Well, in every machine, there are two, two things that you must take note of two types of forces. These forces are called load and effort. Load and effort. What is load? Load is the barrier that you're trying to overcome. Peradventure, you want to carry something from a distance to a distance, or you, you're, you, even you yourself can be the load when you are walking. It's a load. And what is effort? Effort is the amount of force which you impute to move the load. You input your effort into the machine and the machine makes use of that little effort of yours to improve the load, to move the load. Now, the idea of building machines is all about imputing as small effort as possible to moving as big load as possible. So, every machine is designed such that it can move the biggest loads with the smallest effort. That is the aim, that is the design plan for every machine. And also there is what is known as mechanical advantage, velocity ratio, and efficiency. In a few, we'll look deeply into that. But before we look into that, let's see how much you've understood what, we have, what has been taught so far. A few questions to pop up on your screen. Please do well by attempting them. Welcome back. Yes, we talk, we've been talking about machines and I've, made, I've tried to create a, an awareness of something about machines, that machines are created with the sole intent, with the sole intent of making work easier to do. We just want to relieve ourselves of all the stress. We want to move as big load as possible with as little effort as possible. So, in the bid to do this, there are certain things that need to be put into consideration. There is a subject of, there's a thing called the mechanical advantage. The word mechanical there suggests that something has been moved. A job has been done. So, what is mechanical advantage? Mechanical advantage, simply put, is the ratio of work done or the ratio of the load against the effort. That is, mechanical advantage represented by MA equals to the load, that is the force of the load, the load you want to carry, divided by the effort, that's the force you apply. That is, 
mechanical advantage. So it shows that, wow, we've done the job. And there's another entity called the velocity ratio. The velocity ratio. So what does the velocity ratio point out? The velocity ratio simply proves to us further that we did not waste our time. It is simply a ratio of the efforts of the distance of effort with the distance of load. That is, how far did your effort have to go? How far did you have to go with your effort? How far did you have to run with your effort to get the load through this certain distance? So, we do represent distances in machines as when it comes to calculating efficiency we use small letters for distances we use capital letters for forces so as to differentiate the load from the um, so as to differentiate the velocity ratio from the mechanical advantage so we say velocity ratio equals distance traveled by effort divided by distance traveled by the load now there's a subject of there's an entity also described as efficiency. Efficiency. So what do we mean when we talk about efficiency? Efficiency refers to how well or how, to what degree, to what extent was our, intent, in our intention achieved. Our design has been done. Our, our efforts has been put in our load has been lifted how well did this machine work so that is efficiency and efficiency identified with this stylish e equals mechanical advantage divided by velocity ratio multiplied by a hundred and it is measured in percentage. Now, this same mathematics, this same efficiency also might be represented in form of load and effort in case where you only have, you are not told what the mechanical advantage or what the velocity ratio is, you are given the parameters. In that case, if we should, let us try to turn Let's try to bring um, mechanical advantage and velocity ratio together into this equation. So, in this equation, we note, we note that mechanical advantage is L over E, that's capital letters. So, efficiency would also be capital L divided by capital E, which would be divided by our velocity ratio is small e divided by small l and from mathematics yes sorry multiplied by a hundred which shows a percentage from mathematics we learned that whenever we have division like this you turn you turn this one upside down and you change the division to multiplication so it says l that's capital l divided by capital e multiplied by small l divided by small e multiplied by a hundred percent so we have our efficiency to always to also be equal to l that's capital l small l divided by capital e small e multiplied by a hundred to get our answer in percentage classification of machines we can classify machines into several types um, we have the lever system, we have the pulley system, we have the inclined planes and gear system, wheel and hazel, gear, um, the, and the others, belt and pulley. But let's start with the lever system. In the lever system, we have three different types. We have the first order. We have the first order lever system. In the first order lever system, all I want is to keep just keep your eye on one thing. In all the, in all of them, I want you to just keep your eye focused on one thing. And what is the thing I want you to focus your eye on? What is in the middle of the drawing? 
what is in the middle of the drawing. It would, it's a very good pointer for you to know whether it is the first order or the second order or the third order. In the first order, the middle accommodates the fulcrum. Now, you can have your load at this side or on this side, but your load will be on one side while your efforts would be on the other side. Examples of our first order machines, we have our, hammer, our claw armor, um, the pliers, and most of our ant tools. The second order In the second order, what we have in the middle is the load. The load. Now, your, your fulcrum might be here or here. Your efforts might be in front or here at the back. But the middle is the load. While in the third order, oh, example of second order, sorry, example of your second order, we have um, your wheelbarrow, your nut crack, um, crackers, the load is in the middle. In the third order, What we have in the middle is the effort. And you could have your frocom at the front or at the back and the load either at the front or in the back. Examples of the third order examples of third order machinery includes laboratory tongues, or even the human forearm, when you put your hand down, to lift the muzzle ear is actually what is working. It is actually in the middle, you lift things. So, here are the three for the lever system. Now, in the lever system, how do we calculate the velocity ratio? Uh, of course, we already know how we calculate the mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage is always the amount of force the load exerts divided by the amount of force imputed as effort. But for the mechanical advantage, how do we calculate? I'm uh, sorry, velocity ratio. We already discussed that, that velocity ratio equals to distance traveled by effort divided by distance traveled by the load. So, if you look at it now, you measure the distance between, uh, like in this particular one, you measure the distance between your fulcrum and your effort, and you take the measurement of your fulcrum and your load as distance traveled by your load. Distance traveled by the effort is fulcrum to effort. Distance traveled by the load is fulcrum to load. In same manner, distance traveled by effort distance traveled by the load and distance traveled by effort distance traveled by the load in the police system the velocity ratio is very easy to calculate or, or determine all you need to do is to count how many police are in the system how many police are actually functional in the system so the number of police present is the value for the velocity ratio. While your mechanical advantage also remains, it maintains the way, proper way of calculation. In the inclined plane, which has um, something like um, this.
the velocity ratio is, ratio is calculated as 1 over sine theta. Let's take this for a, uh, a complete triangle. And of course, 90 degrees, the ground and the height where it goes. You roll the inclined plane across this. So this is the distance through which the load goes. Where well, you want to get it up here. So your effort actually is not so much. Your work is against gravity. So for the inclined plane, velocity ratio is calculated at 1 over sine theta. Your effort goes all across this. That is, you roll the load up the entire hill. But what you just want to do is to get it to this place. You have to do so much. You have to go through a long distance to get it up here. But you don't have to impute as much force as it would have required if you were to pull it directly. That's the benefit. So, it's calculated as... 1 over sine theta, and let's label this as a A, B, and C. Our A, C represents our effort, while our B, C represents the distance, um, A, C represents distance traveled by the effort, while B, C represents distance traveled by the load. So, according to what we were taught, by um, this Sokatua, joins this that this is the hypotenuse and this is the opposite because it's facing the angle so kaswa joins them together using sine and that will be sine theta and following so kaswa sine theta will me it will be what opposite divided by the hypotenuse and our opposite is bc divided by our hypotenuse is ac so our velocity ratio is always what? Distance traveled by effort divided by distance traveled by the load. And what we have up here, BC, is distance traveled by the load. While AC is distance traveled by the effort. So if, I, if we should try to, this is distance traveled by the load and this is distance traveled by the effort. Which means the reciprocal of this would give us the velocity ratio. That's why we say velocity ratio in an inclined plane equals to 1 over sine theta. In the hydraulic press, we discussed about uh, we discussed the hydraulic machines earlier, and we said they, they come in something like this. So, taking that the hydraulic press comes with um, uh, circular shapes. So, that would mean we need to take the radius of this, let's call it small r, and the radius of this, let's call it big r. And we know that, of course, it works with the, uh, with the ideology of area. So, our velocity ratio in this particular context would be the area of this divided by the area of this so when we are trying to calculate the area of this that will be because this is where our effort is and this is where our load is and of course it's always effort over load area of this as pi r squared divided by pi r squared of course r will cancel r so we have pi r squared divided by r we have r squared divided by r squared as our velocity ratio so for the hydraulic press Velocity ratio equals to R squared divided by R squared. Where the R up here is the one for the effort. And the R down here is the one for the load. In the screw, our velocity ratio is calculated by 2 pi A over P. Where A is the altitude of the pitch of the screw and p is the pitch a is the altitude of the screw teeth or the height of the screw or the, of the screw teeth and p is the pitch of the screw 
also we have um, the wheel and azul. Wheel and azul are is, is it has um, two barrels connected to each other directly. Now the the in the wheel and azul for the wheel and azul you have the bigger parts which serves as the wheel and the smaller part which serves as the azul. Now the diameter of your wheel let's is, let's call it um, a and the diameter of the as let's call it b so this is where you put in your effort and this is where the load is being carried the load is attached to this as you turn this it takes it it is easier to turn this because it is wider and it carries or it depends on the kind of thing you want to do if you want to carry a very heavy load you attach it to this side it would move it or you attach it to this side depending on what you have at art one of them takes a longer period while the other one carries a heavier job so it depends on which is carrying your load and which is carrying your uh, which um, which place you are in setting your effort the velocity ratio for the wheel and azo of course we already said this is where the effort is and this is where the load is and the law still applies, which means our velocity ratio will be equal to A divided by B. The last one we have here is gears. For the gears, gears are, um, they come with number of teeth. They have several teeth. The gears have teeth. So the driver has his own teeth. The driven has his own teeth. Now the driver is where the effort comes in. The driver is the one that drives the driven so it is the number of teeth of the driver divided by the number of teeth of the driven for the gears the velocity ratio equals the number of teeth of the driver divided by the number of teeth of the driven the driver is the one that is turning the other one that is where your effort is being input you put in your efforts you put in your effort in at the driver point the driver gears are the ones that have your effort. Your effort goes there. While the driven is the one that bears the load. It's the one that carries the load. So as you are turning the driver, the load begins to move. On several occasions, I have told you that when a body is moving in a specific, with a specific um, velocity or acceleration, it will keep moving like that forever. But it doesn't happen in real life. You and I know that. What is the cause? Well, it is this interesting guy called friction. Friction is a kind of a, is an opposition force that comes to play when two surfaces begin to rub on one another. For us to understand friction for better, we need to understand certain principles that act when a body is in a position. This body is a mass, let's, uh, I'm assuming it to be a box of books. And someone wants to drag this box of books in this direction. As this box of books is like this, in, the, in it, it has books, which means it has a weight. It has mass. So the weight is acting downward. That is um, mg. According to Newton's third law of motion, it says to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction so to this action of mg there will be a reaction from the same point which is equal to it and it is called r the reaction now um, the person who wants to carry the bag drags the bag with a force but you observe that it is not all of that force. Even if he's pushing it, 
perpendicular to the line of action. It is not all of that force that gets to take, that gets to move the bag forward. The bag does not move with a, comp with a continuous acceleration. If you push a box on the ground, it will slide and it will get to a point to stop moving. What stops it? It is that action, which is, uh, which is, is the reaction that is occurring due to the rubbing of the surface of the box with the floor. And that is called friction. Our friction is a our friction. The friction exerted on the body is proportional to the reaction of the body, to the normal reaction. That is, friction is directly proportional to R. Their relationship is established by mu, which is called the coefficient of friction. This is the coefficient of friction. So friction equals to coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal reaction. So the friction that will be experienced by a body is dependent on the reaction. Now, there are other things also that affect friction. What are the factors that friction depends on? The nature of the substances, that is the floor and the bag, the box, it controls, those are part of the things that mu depends on. Um, the area of in contact, the area with which the, the amount of space within which the bag makes contact with the floor also has effects on the amount of friction that will be experienced. And also the presence of lubricants or other substances in between them. In this topic, we looked at machines. Question. Lubricants have effect on friction, and their effect on friction is negative. In other words, they reduce friction, thereby allowing the person who wants to pull the bag move faster. Friction is, friction is actually good, and friction is actually bad. Friction is bad because it makes your walk, it makes your bag heavier, but friction is good because it is, it is a principle, it is every mechanical device is built around the principles of friction. No, without friction on your car tires and the car road and the express road, your vehicle will not be able to move. If your express road were to be perfectly smooth and your car tire were to be perfectly smooth, the tire would only be turning on top of the road at a particular point and there will be no movement. So friction is actually responsible for the initial movement, even though, even though a lot of force is required to get this motion started. On your express road, there is an event called skidding. It occurs, more, it occurs more frequently when there is rain. And skidding is simply your tires losing friction. When there is rain on the road, that is water molecules, it makes the road appear smoother than it actually is, thereby making your tires not to find enough grip to move, resulting in what is called skidding. And this causes a lot of accidents. Velocity ratio is calculated by the by R squared. The R now is that of the effort divided by R squared, which is the R of the load and in the, in the screw we said velocity ratio is calculated uh, by the formula 2 uh, 2 pi a divided by p where a is the amplitude and p is the pitch of the screw we talked about friction and we defined friction as the opposition to the free movement of objects and we also talked about normal reaction and how friction comes about come about in a few seconds 
some questions will show on your screen. Please do answer them. And if there is anything that you feel you do not understand, you can go over the video one more time.